I was highly excited on my very first day at the rocket range at Tumba. I was born in South India and had lived there for the first 22 years of my life, but I had never visited Kerala. My first glimpse of Kerala from the train was breathtaking. Miles and miles of intense green, picturesque beaches and beautiful flowing rivers. I took a bicycle and I pedaled around the rocket range in Tumba. I felt I had entered some sort of a paradise. These were the words of R Aravamudan in his book ISRO a personal history. Aravamudan was one of the earliest to join India's space program along with Dr E V Chitnis and Dr Abdul Kalam. In the first episode on this podcast series of India's space journey we saw how the church at Tumba the bishop's house and the local school had become the hub for the Indian space program. NASA had sent one of its rockets to Tumba and this was to be launched from the Indian soil. And along with the rocket they had also sent their technicians. These technicians walked into the church and were taken aback by the sight in front of them. The Indian space scientists were sitting on the floor of the church assembling the rocket parts in front of the altar of the church and high up above them NASA technicians could see pigeons happily perched on the rooftop of the church and creating a cacophony. And beneath them in a corner were scientists and engineers conducting experiments. This was not what they expected from a rocket launching site. Luckily for them and for India, the launches were quite successful and the NASA scientists went back home with their data. But they also said to their bosses, "Oh boy, we had to work under such primitive conditions." But for Indian space scientists and engineers like Aravamudan, these were not primitive. These were exciting times. The church had become their home and the pigeon their family. And while all of this was going on at Tumba, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, the father of India's space journey, who was sitting in Mumbai, was dreaming a grander vision. He wanted India to build its own satellites and its own launching vehicles. Launching vehicles are those giant majestic things that carry our rockets, shoot into space and then fall off once their jobs are done. But where was India going to build its own launch pad, a space port to launch its own rockets? The year was 1968, and here's a story from then. But before we delve into that, a quick introduction into who we are. You're listening to What's New Today, a podcast about current events. This is your host Sangeeta from India. and as always i chat with two curious children in this episode to hear their perspectives on science space and what they make of the stories from the early days of india's space journey my name is dhruv and i am 11 years old i am very interested in maths and physics i really hope to be a doctor an astronaut or a pilot when i grow up I thought you also wanted to be a singer that you discussed with me before we started the podcast. Yeah. Yes. But for singer are you also someone who pursues music like you learn music too? Yeah, I learn music. Very diverse set of interest through very interesting. So what do you learn in music? Um actually I learn Carnatic classical and Hindustani classical. Both. Wow. Very nice. Good luck. Do you actually enjoy going to these classes? or is send someone yeah. sending you at gun point no i really enjoy singing like it actually cheers me up wow kudos to your teacher and uh, to all the other children you're learning with thank you which school do you go to adhruv i go to deans academy i live in bangalore Hi my name is Pranshi Chadwar I study in grade 6 at SP Nutan Academy I really like dancing especially Kathak which is a classical dance uh, I enjoy doing arts and crafts in my free time Wow we have a very very diverse set of um, interests for Pranshi also 
Panchi, it's very interesting huh, that I've got two people on this show, both with a strong interest in uh, classical music and classical dance. So how long have you been learning Kathak? For three, four years. We have to go to classes every Monday and Wednesday, but I enjoy. Very nice. Do you also practice after that? If I get time. <laughs> okay. Since you did say that you're a classical dancer, a quick trivia question for both of you. Have you heard of someone called uh, Rinalni Sarabhai or Malika Sarabhai? I've heard Sarabhai, but not the names. These two first names that I gave. So which Sarabhai have you heard of? Vikram Sarabhai. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So maybe because we were doing this episode series on space that you all went and read up about Vikram Sarabhai? I had seen a movie on him. So that is how I know. And I've also read many books about him. Really? Yeah. Okay. Can you share what all you found very interesting in the books that you all have read or the movies that you, you saw? Actually, I've, I've read a book called Dopey Rockets from Tumba, where Vikram Sarabhai launches a rocket of, from the magnetic equator. And then uh, it's about a girl who helps them transport all their uh, parts of the rocket to the church where they're going to launch it. Is this a it's, fictional story or? Uh... Uh, I think it's fictional. A um, 10 year old girl, actually. Uh, and she helped them transport it in those carts which they had in the uh, village. Pranshu, what did, uh, what did you find very interesting in the movies that you've seen? I'm assuming you're talking about Rocket Boys. Yes. Uh, I have not Rocket seen Rocket Boys. Boys, so I don't know. But, uh, was it very interesting? Yes, it was interesting. If you like space, you will enjoy it. Uh, I personally find space very interesting. The way how they succeeded, how the Indian scientists succeeded. Like, they were on a very low budget and they made a science. They made an entire rocket and the launch, they launched it successfully. Uh, I remember there was a part in the movie where they were bringing the parts of the rocket from one place to another and they were transporting it through air. They mm. lost half of the parts. They lost all their hope, but still they succeeded. I don't remember how because it, I watched it a long time ago. Yeah, this point about uh, Indian scientists having to work on a low budget was not just true when Dr. Vikram Sarabhai or Dr. Homije Baba were there. It is true even today. You know, Chandrayaan 3, today we've launched it. I think it has cost Indians about 600 odd crores of rupees. Yeah, actually, it's 650 crores. But uh, compared to the other uh, countries, it's very uh, we got it very cheap. Yeah. Like other countries have paid even more than us. Do you know how much it costs in other countries? No, I, I think my grandfather told me that, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's true, but my grandfather said their budgets are 10 times more than ours. Yeah, it could easily be 10 times more. Um, forget comparing us to other countries' space missions. There are movies like there's a very famous movie called Interstellar, which is made by... Yes, I watched that one. You did? Did I you remember. like it? Yes. Okay. Even the making of that movie was way more expensive. Uh, it is around 800 crores to make that movie. Then the entire mission for us to send Chandrayaan 3 to the moon. Can you imagine that? So we have always been very, very good at working on shoestring budgets. We were all talking about how Vikram Dasarabhai's first ever launch that he managed was from a place called Tumba, right? Tumba is in Kerala. But yes. India then needed a launch place. You know, when you have to launch, launch, launch a rocket, uh, you need a place on, on the eastern coasts, preferably. In any country, if you go and if you look at the launch pads, it will always be on the eastern coasts of those countries. Do you want to take a wild guess why it is east and not west? 
Is okay. this more auspicious? <laughs> no, it's nothing to do with a superstition. But I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the Earth's rotation. Because when the Earth rotates, the eastern part is the first part that gets the sunlight. Very close. Why does the eastern part get its sunlight first? Because it's like rotating like this. So west to east, it rotates west from west to east. Hmm. That's right. He was spot on 100% correct. So when the earth rotates from the west to east, right? So naturally there is some momentum which is already there. So you want to send a rocket to space. You don't want to send it in the opposite direction of the earth's rotation. Hmm. Then you're fighting further, right? So you need even more fuel to thrust. So if you look at the launch pads of any country, even in the United States, it's on the eastern coast. It's in Florida. It's in a place called Cape Canaveral. So and um, Australia also has a launch pad on the eastern coast. India, of course, has uh, a launch in pad. In Andhra Pradesh. Na, yeah. So how that launch pad was identified, that took, you know, there's a very nice story about how that location was identified. In fact, the place that we are going to talk about, it's called Sri Harikota in Andhra Pradesh, right? Yes. It's considered yes. the world's second best launch site after the United States Cape Canaveral launch site in Florida. India is the world's second best launch site. So there's a reason why most of the launch pads will be closer to the equator. Because the equator, in the equator, the, the surface is exactly perfect flat. Great try, but uh, no, that's not the reason. I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the speed. In the equator, the speed is the most because it is exact perfect in between. It's true that the on the equator, the rotation speed is the highest compared to the speed uh, at which the Earth rotates, you know, closer to the poles. So because the rotation speed is so high, they obviously when you're sending a rocket, you, you want to get as much support as you can from the Earth itself for the rocket to go as fast as it can. So one, you're moving it in the same direction of the Earth's rotation, so which is why it's on the eastern coast. Second, you want to keep it on as close to the equator, the, the geographic equator I'm talking about, not the magnetic one, so that you'll get the support of the very, very fast rotation. So which is why when France wanted to get its launch pad they are in a place in South America. It's a place called French Guyana. So they also have it as close to the eastern side as they can and as close to the equator. France doesn't have any eastern coast also. All the coasts of France are on the west. Uh -huh. India also has all of these benefits. We also had east coast and west coast. And of course, we are very close to the equator. So we didn't have to go out. So there's the story about how Sri Harikota was... Um, you know, identified. So I, this is, there's a very interesting book that I read as part of my research for this. It's called ISRO Personal History by R. Arava Mudan. This is a site called Sri Harikota, which is about 100 kilometers north of Madras. The government of Andhra Pradesh was very happy to give this entire island to ISRO for its space launch. Now, there's a very interesting story about how Dr. Sarabhai's first visit, he had to go and see this place, this jungle in the middle of nowhere, the big island off the coast of Andhra Pradesh. When Dr. Vikram Sarabhai and his team, they had to uh, reach, they first assembled in a church in Sulur Peta. So he says, it looks like we were destined that um, all our major ventures in those early years were destined to be baptized in churches only. Then they all piled into a number of jeeps and moved towards the Pulikat Lake. The lake had no water, so the jeep was able to easily drive on the waterbed and cross the lake. Now, after a few kilometers, we reached the Buckingham Canal. Now, imagine this is the 1960s. Okay? India didn't have a lot, very well-established road and a rail network. The entire team had to get out of the vehicle so that the empty jeeps could cross the temporary bridge. Now, the bridge had been made by putting together a lot of branches and stones. That's all. Uh, it was a jungle safari. 
and the freshly created track was made of logs which were hewn together with forest trees and that's how they had made any track at all on the road it was a very interesting adventure uh, for all of us the they are all space scientists and the most enthusiastic one was dr sara bhai uh, who was by then much older than many of these people but he was still very excited many times our jeeps got stuck in the sand we had to get out and we had to push have you all ever had to get out of a vehicle that's stuck and ever had to push yes once my car broke down i didn't have to push it i just had to stand aside it <laughs> didn't break it. down petrol khatam so a few vehicles completely broke down and we had to abandon them one jeep even caught fire and we had to douse it with sand <laughs> at long last the bay of bengal sparkled before us we had covered 20 kilometers but it we had felt as though we had battled through miles of jungle this beach was very different this was a forest where there were large acreage of casuarina plantations a number of birds and animals lived there and even to this day by the way live there you find monkeys jackals rabbits and wild pigs roaming in the forests there were occasional sightings of leopards too over there and a remarkable presence of huge herds of wild cattle and there were exotic water birds huge flocks of flamingos painted storks and pelicans now today when you all see on tv you know the chandrayaan 3 which took off from shri harikota in the 1960s when they had to identify this location this is how they all went all the space scientists they had to go on jeeps which broke down and then they found this huge jungle and then of course they cleared the space and built the launch pad that we all today see on tv do you find this interesting it was like it inspired me a lot what did it like it, it like it shows us that before uh, people were not so like relaxed and all they were all very hard working to get things everywhere and right now we we just need to get one truck we have normal roads proper roads now so it's very inspiring wow very sweet dr r arava mudanno the person who's written this book he uh, also served as the director of this uh, shri harikota center which is today called the satish dhavan uh, space mm-hmm. center so he said in shri harikota at night you can very often hear jackals howling you might hear some silent movement of the leopards but of course it was outside the place where these people stayed it was not a threat to their lives It, to this day even today if you go to shri harikota a lot of the wild jungle is preserved would you like to go visit the wild jungles yes no i like the natural beauty of jungle i'm not really too fond of wild animals but i still like a um, few of them i like lions and tigers but i'm not very fond of them yeah Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Now, I am okay with going in an armored vehicle and visiting the space center, but I would not be comfortable, you know, being let on my own. It is today, of course, the one of the most important spaceports in the entire world. Uh, many countries today send their rockets and their satellites to India for us to launch them from this Sri Hari Kota spaceport. I'm feeling proud. Yes. Today Shri Hari Kota has launched satellites for many countries in Europe including Germany, France and the UK. Also for many countries in the Middle East including the UAE, Kazakhstan and lots of Southeast Asian countries too such as Japan, South Korea, Singapore and Indonesia. And we have also launched satellites for the US and Canada. If you're wondering why India's launch pad at Sri Harikota would be used by the United States when they have their own launch vehicle facility, it's because of two reasons. 
India's satellite launch vehicles are considered one of the most reliable in the world and one of the most cost effective too. So before I wrap up this episode while I was researching for you know about the stories in this episode I came across two photographs uh, that really speak a thousand words one is a photo of a bullock cart carefully transporting parts of a communication satellite this was taken in 1981 now we definitely had jeeps and cars in 1981 so why a bullock cart it's because our scientists needed a uh, a transportation vehicle which was non magnetic so instead of rebuilding an entire vehicle which had no electromagnetic parts they decided to use a bullock cart smart right the second is one of my favorite photographs it's a photo of vikram sarabhai sitting with his son and daughter who were both less than 10 years old then you can see him happily showing pictures of objects in the solar system from a book To me this is a photo of a loving father and a teacher whose first love was teaching science to children. In the next episode we see one of Vikram Sarabhai's earliest dreams come true. Will he be around to see them? We'll find out in the next episode. All stories for this episode were taken from the book ISRO a personal history by R Aravamudan. and Vikram Sarabhai's biography by Amrita Shah new episodes on what's new today come out every monday and friday thanks for listening <laughs>